Diversity is easy to hire and to put the right people in the seats. The inclusion is the hard part. Making people feel like they belong, that their ideas and their different ways are actually valued. That's the hard part. Put that coffee down. Creators are leaders. Be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. Helen, we're both in sales. Let me tell you why I suck as a salesman. They realize that to be in power, you didn't need guns or money or even numbers. You just needed the will to do what the other guy wouldn't. I'm not leaving. The show goes on. Well, hello there, friend. Welcome back to the Construction Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Bradley Hartman. I'm excited to bring to you today my conversation with Erin Thorpe. She's an author, speaker, and coach for construction leaders who struggle with conflict communication and performance during high-stress times. And as we all know, It's always high stress times. That's kind of what we deal with in the construction industry. And that is her background. And you will hear her powerful story of growing up in rural Canada in the Alaskan bush. You're going to understand a little bit of how she developed this level of empathy of growing up with addiction and being part of a large family that was dealing with that. And that led into her construction career that really gave her this unique perspective of helping construction firms. So in this conversation with Erin and in her book, she talks about how we can add humanness back into technical fields, really tactical ways that we can bring more of this humanity back into what we do every day. And if you may be thinking, do we really need to do that? Well, I think as we think about this war for talent and this multi-generational workplace and ongoing conflict between how things get done and how we view things and how we view our jobs and how we view loyalty. We're seeing more and more turnover and less retention amongst young, talented people, which I believe requires our leaders to change the way that we lead, me included. And in her book and in this conversation, she talks about everyday empathic leadership and what that means and how, quite frankly, these are not drastic changes that need to be made. These are small little pivots. This is increased awareness and small changes that we can make to become better leaders. So as you will hear in our conversation today, she's easy to talk to and she's easy to listen to, and she's going to give you some practical tips to become a better leader. This is why we do the show. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Aaron Thorpe. Miss Aaron Thorpe, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. I'm thrilled you're here. You can see from your book here, it's uh, I got lots of notes. This might distract me later because what I wanted to do is you did a really nice job of pulling in some really interesting and relevant quotes, not only just to the topic, but I also think to our construction audience. So if you're open to this, I was going to throw you a little curveball. Is there was three specific quotes that I think might serve as good kind of guideposts for different sections of the conversation that we might have. Sure, it sounds great. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to start with this one. Marshall Goldsmith is one of my favorites. His book, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, I think is yep. not only an incredible book, but it might be the greatest title for a book like ever. But starting at chapter three, I thought maybe this could be an entree into learning about your background. I got to hear more about growing up in the rural bush of Alaska, and I want to hear about that, but also your family life and how you got into construction. But the quote is, after living with their dysfunctional behavior for so many years, people become invested in defending their dysfunctions rather than changing them. So for me, this resonated on a personal level, on a professional level. So maybe just take this off, Aaron, and give us a little background on how you grew up and some of your family life and how you got into construction. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that, that's a quote I come back to all the time, right? Because, and it's true, you find yourself in these moments of defending what you know instead of making a change for, you know, usually the better or at least trying something new. So, my parents are farmers from Northern Alberta, Canada. And when I was two years old, they decided to move to Bush, Alaska. And my dad joined his brother in a business there. And my parents went on to have three more children. So by the time we left, when I was nine, there was four kids. And part of the reason we left was during that time of 
living in remote, isolated Alaska, which was great as a kid. I mean, growing up, literally dog sleds and all these indigenous old ladies taking care of us and being out on the rivers and picking berries and all the things you would think of was great as a child. But I think for my parents, it was very difficult to have four kids, to be isolated, to have no family and really cut off from really kind of social supports. They ended up, part of the reason we came back to Canada was for family support. And my parents had just recently gotten sober after experiencing some addiction issues. And so we moved back to the farm and that's where I spent the rest of my childhood. And so from kind of that nine years old, I was about nine when they got sober. I really was immersed in this environment of, if you want what I have, you need to do what I do, which is a little mantra that comes out of most 12-step programs, but also saw and was witness to them really being able to look at the dysfunction in the face and go, that's not what we want, right? Every day, choosing something different. As I increase my own education about, you know, how the brain works, how, what it means to be a human being, you really get a sense of our brains are designed to keep us safe and surviving, not thriving. And I think that's why it's so hard sometimes to change our behaviors. And now that I work with, with organizations, I really see this. All of these phrases, like it's the way we've always done things and it's always worked for us. This is us hanging on to our dysfunction, right? And not stepping into what do we need to change to thrive in today's world, right? With today's workforce, with the problems and the challenges and the opportunities that exist in today's world. So back to a little bit of my story, I grew up on a farm when it came time to make the decision of what are you going to do with your life, which is really funny now that I have children that are at this age. It seems like such a huge decision when you're 17 years old to pick the one thing that you're going to do for the rest of your life, which I now know is not true because we all evolve and change. But I was presented with my high school counselor who said, hey, you could be a nurse or a teacher. You're a girl. Let's, what do you want to be? Oh my gosh. And you know, I love that you're laughing because that was my reaction. I was like, what? I and I grew up in a family of nurses and teachers and have the utmost respect for these professions, but it wasn't my calling. I knew from day one that that was not what I was going to do. But I also didn't know what was available to me. So at that point, I took the university calendar home because it was a big, hefty book, you know, and was like, I know I need to get out of here because I'm definitely, and, and this is, this actually worked for me, but now I've come to learn we should never say never. I said at the time, I'm never going to marry a farmer. I'm glad that one didn't come back to bite me because um, I didn't, but I knew I wanted to get out and I knew I wanted to do something a little bit different. Flipping through that calendar, I came across engineering. All the classes I need are my favorite classes in high school. I love math and science. Let's go see. So left home, started my degree and Decided to get some experience through an internship program about halfway through my degree because I had no idea what you actually do for work as an engineer. And a construction company hired me. And they're a general contractor. I had an absolute blast. I worked 18 months, did the estimate, uh, got approvals, built the building, signed it over, hand over keys, moved everybody in. It was like if you could paint the picture of like the perfect rewarding experience for a student to figure out what they wanted to do with their career, this was it. And I was hooked, honestly. I was just like, this is what I want to do. I want to build these things. I want to be able to go back and see the fruits of my labor. I loved working with the trades. I loved learning about you know, how things come together, the designers, the tradespeople. And it's where I thought I would spend the rest of my career, to be really honest with you. And then, you know, graduating and, and then the hard work started. So the first five years were pretty easy. Um, and then my husband and I decided to have a family. And construction and kids is hard, hard for everybody. You know, I see it with as my career grew and I was now leading young dads and moms. It's hard on both. Doesn't matter on the gender. It's hard. There's long hours. There's lots of demands. And at that time, I was being led by my leaders at that time were predominantly, looking back, all of them actually were married men who had wives that stayed at home and raised babies. That was my experience. It's not everybody's, but that was mine. And so some of these conversations, like I have to go pick up my kid from daycare or my kid is sick or I need to be flexible and you know, maybe 
can I work from home today? All of these conversations were foreign to these leaders at the time. And so there was a lot of like, it just felt so much harder to do my job than I thought it should be because there was no understanding of what my lived experience was. And that continued throughout my career. By the time I got into my own leadership positions around the 10 to 15 year mark, I now started getting to this con- invited to this conversation that was like, hey, Aaron, why are so many mid-career engineers leaving their career, specifically females? Why are they leaving? And I was like, get out from under your rock, people. Like, where... Why can't you see this? You know, and that's, I think that's what sparked this curiosity around why do we see it differently? And why can't some people see what other people can see? The pivot in my career came when my daughter was in grade six. She was diagnosed with some learning disabilities. I ended up having to take a step back from my career to just deal with what she needed to be, you know, and I had two little boys as well. So it was like all the family things came up. I took a step back. But used to being a busy and productive person, I didn't know what to do with myself while she was in tutoring and she was in her appointments. And I just started writing because I was like, there's something here. And that's really what formed the book. And the book didn't start as a book. It started as like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about why I think we need empathy and leadership and why I think it's important for leaders to understand what their team members are going through and to take time to listen but it turned into a book. Well, you said something yesterday when we were kind of catching up beforehand that really stood out to me when you were just talking about some of your experiences and the way that leaders around you, generally male, were trying to help. And we always see this where a lot of the people that get to the top, they're problem solvers. They make things happen and they they look at a situation, they understand the components and they make an immediate reaction. And you said, I noticed when you said this, there's just one word difference between I know what's wrong with this, as in this situation. And then when it gets to, hey, this isn't a situation, this isn't a a foundation that needs to be repaired. This is a, there's a human element here and air and I, and then I transitioned from, I know what's wrong with this to I know what's wrong with you. So maybe go into that a little bit because I think on some level, our industry has come to the acceptance that diverse teams, gender, ethnicity, age, leads to better thinking and better outcomes and better results, right? And yet we get a bunch of guys and I'll put myself in that group too when certain things will come up and I'm like, what? How are these other people viewing this any other way than what is most obvious to me, you know? So maybe I I have to imagine it. I know this is, this comes up in kind of your coaching, the way you help your clients. How do you help people get that other perspective when they haven't lived that perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's true. As an engineer, as someone who grew up in the construction industry, we get paid, promoted, and celebrated for solving technical problems quickly. And the faster I can do it, the more I can get done, the faster we can work through issues, the less time, downtime we have, time is money, you know, all of those things that we all intuitively know that we're trying to solve and move forward in our construction careers. When it comes to the people, on the team, all the people that are involved in a construction job site or in a, you know, engineering problem, the exact opposite is true. The slower we go, the better decisions we make, right? And so it's, it's literally like shifting gears. It's like from being in sixth gear, hundred miles an hour down the highway to now being in reverse, you know, and, and making that change on a dime. And so it is, it's like recognizing, and that's the work I do. It's just, is this a technical problem or is this a people problem, right? Because they require two different skill sets. No different than if you're going to hang a picture and you have a drywall anchor with a screw, you need a drill and a screwdriver. But if you have a drywall anchor with a nail, you need a hammer, right? Like it's a very simple (laughs) analogy, but it's like you need the right tool for the right job, right? Yes. It's a good analogy for someone who occasionally I'm like, you know what? I'm too lazy. I'm, I got a screw. I got a hammer. I'm going to make this work. I know. If anyone on my team or my wife who I work with is listening, they're like, yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's, that's what we're talking about, man. It is. It, and we all do it. We all use the side of a wrench when we really need a hammer or, you know, like right. we make do. But the point is, is if we really want to do a good job and if this really does matter, we need the better, we need the right tool for the right job. And so, when it comes to these people problems and people discussions, we have to slow down 
we have to, it's, it's actually activating a different part of our brain. So the technical problems are solved predominantly in the left side of our brain where our logic and reason are activated. But when people are having big feelings, and if you are a human being, you have emotion. You might express it in a very different way from me, but you have emotion because I've had this conversation a lot with predominantly the male gender who's like, no, no, I don't do emotion. I'm like, you do do it. You do it. <laughs> yes. False. You do. You may hide it. You may try to want to yes. put it away and you may exhibit it in different ways, but it's there. When it comes to emotion, and especially when we're having big emotions, if we're kind of feeling like we're unsafe, whether that's, or just even like really joyful or really happy, the brain actually doesn't have access to logic and reasoning. So this is why like when someone's having a big reaction to something and we say, just calm down, it's not helpful, right? That's logic and reasoning. It's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Like it's the wrong tool. Again, we're just showing up in the wrong way. So when we realize that we've got big emotions and the human element involved in a situation, we have to switch gears and bring the right tool. Yeah, that's really well said. Well, I think what I just wrote down that really jumped out at me is you said, we make do, right? We make do. And we, most, most of the people who are listening, they're already successful. They care about the product. We would never just give something, a product, a process, a finished project to a customer and say, you know what, <laughs> Aaron, uh, you're the owner here. You know, uh, we made do. So there you go. Here are the keys. Moving when you can. We made do. Yeah. And I think it's, it's about 80%. <laughs> should be okay. <laughs> right. We, you make, we made do. Never. But but with us, you're right. You know, it's kind of like, well, we make do with what we've got, right? I wish we had more time. I wish we had, I wish we had more resources. I wish I could sit down with Aaron for an hour today, but I can't. So we make do. And I think that's how do we overcome that? I think it's just a really powerful thing because that's something we hear all the time. We do. And I think this is where we've got to look at like, is, you know, it goes back to the first quote. Are we just defending our dysfunction or, our, and you can call it dysfunction. You can call it current way. You can call it, you know, the way we've always done things, whatever you want to call it. Are we defending that or are we actively looking for ways to get better, you know, and then acting as if. So if you want to build a culture of trust and engagement and innovation, are you acting in ways that promote trust and engagement and innovation? And I guarantee you, it's going to require that you do something different than you have done in the past. And it's going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to feel like Bambi on the ice and the shaky legs, and you're probably going to crash and burn a couple of times, and you're not going to get it right the first time. And we keep going. I'm not sure this is, this is, I don't have the answer to this, but somewhere along the lines, because I'm just in the middle of, of watching my kids go through this, but I'm paying attention to it. Children are allowed to make mistakes. And in fact, we encourage it, right? Get back on the bike, take a second shot. You know, it's okay that we lost the game, whatever it is, right? But somewhere along the line in our development as human beings, we it becomes unacceptable for us to not know the answer or for us to try something new. And my part of my work is really dispelling that myth and going, you have to keep trying things new, right? What, what got you here won't get you there. Yeah. Well, I'm going right? to jump in here. I had flagged this and I was like, I don't know if it's going to tie into our conversation, but it totally does here. Uh, it's from page 103, chapter six. It, we're getting a little bit of order. That's fine. But you right. Most people show up wanting to give their best and very few people are comfortable with saying, I don't know how to do that. Would you help me learn? Or I'm not clear on what you're asking me to do. Would you explain it in a different way? Because they fear being seen as incompetent or unable to handle the job. And I think of this often because my mind does work quickly. I'm not going to say it functions well. I'm just saying it works fast. I speak fast, like things that happen. And then it's only later I realize they, they weren't going to slow me down and they're going to say, all right, I don't know exactly what he's looking for but I'm going to do my best. And kind of this idea of, I always fear, we talk about FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. I think of fold, fear of looking dumb. And how do we give permission for people to do that? How would you approach this? If I, if I said, hey, I'm Aaron, we have this issue. It comes up all the time. You got 20 minutes. Do you start with the leader? Do you start with the person assuming there's permission to stop them? 
If you said, I got a minimum amount of time and I'm going to give you one tactical thing to help that exact problem where you're not afraid of feeling dumb to slow each other down so you can collaborate better, how might you approach it? The first thing that I would tweak, and it is a minor adjustment, is what I see most often in my clients is the leader will do the recap of what they've asked the team member to do, right? So they'll say, hey, Bradley, this is it, you know, X, Y, Z, you've got it. And Bradley's going to sit there and go, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, I got it, right? Because you don't want to look dumb. The problem with that is you actually don't know if Bradley's got it as a leader. So the small tweak is, hey, Bradley, can you tell me what you heard? And can you repeat back what it is you're going to go away and do? Right. And that's just a small tweak. It feels like it takes more time because the leader has to listen. They're going to probably miss a couple things. They're going to have to coach them through it. And it's going to feel like, oh, this is taking a really long time. It would be so much easier if I could just tell Bradley what I want him to do. But you miss the opportunity. You miss the teaching opportunity and you miss the ability to really connect to go, yeah, you heard it correctly. Or step one and two are right, but three is is actually this. So not only do I leave feeling like you've got it, you leave feeling like you've got it and you know exactly what needs to be done. And and I say the leader needs to do this because it's really hard for the team member to go, hey, I'd like to recap for you what I think I've heard. That would be a great skill for a team member to have. But again, it's a, it takes there's a little bit more risk involved with that. And so if the leaders can develop the skill to just say, I'd like you to tell me what you think you heard, and then we'll see if we're on the same page. That's where I would start with just one tactical change. I think that would be helpful. And thinking of someone who has been accused of uh, maybe a little, I think accidentally, I don't think I do this deliberately on purpose. I don't want to make people feel dumb in any way, but like the Socratic method, which is a little bit of that. Hey, Aaron, can you go and repeat, you know, kind of where we stand now? But I think if, if you say, hey, we're going to do this consistently and we're going to do it to each other. It's not just me. It's not from top down, but it's like everyone is like, you're going to ask me to do stuff. And I'm going to say, hey, can I repeat this back? So as long as I think you set that, otherwise my fear would be the tone of, all right, Aaron, I just explained this all to you. Why don't you take a moment now to repeat (laughs) it back to me? That's where I'm like, "Ah." I'm sure I've done that in the past. And people are like, you know what? I don't like this guy. I don't like working for him. But I think that is really helpful of just, you're right, of just reframing that, say, when I leave here, I'm going to do one, two, and three, because that's what you've shared with me. That's what I've heard. If if you think there's something missing, now is your time, Bradley, to speak to, you know, to help me do this right the first time. Yeah, because to your point, you know, we don't all approach things the same way because of that this lived experience. And while intellectually we know that diversity makes better decisions, when we see that play out, we don't li- our brain doesn't like different, doesn't like change. Automatically sees you doing it differently than I would do it and it goes that's wrong. Even though you might get to the same point, right? And so that's why diversity is easy to hire and to put the right people in the seats. The inclusion is the hard part. Making people feel like they belong that their ideas and their different ways are actually valued. That's the hard part. And that comes down to those daily actions. Well, maybe that's, this is be a good transition here for us going to expectations. You, a quote from Anne Lamott, who's one of my, she's so funny and so smart, just an incredible author. But I'll say her quote is, expectations are resentments under construction. How do you view that? So expectations are resentments under construction. What does that mean to you? Why did you lead off chapter six, exploring expectations with that quote? Because the biggest stumbles I have had are always, they always start with, well, I expected you to blah, 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 right? Whatever it is. And when I hear those words forming in my brain now, I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't actually speak them out loud right? I, I thought that you would approach this like I do. And I didn't tell you, and I didn't set the tone or the the table with what good looked like. And now I'm going to hold you accountable for an expectation, like for, to deliver something that I never told you about. And so it's no wonder I'm resentful that you didn't get it right. 
you know? So all the times you feel resentful towards people, and this is applicable at home and at work, because I'll tell you, this does not stop at the boardroom table, right? Everything from like, how I want the kitchen cleaned or how I expect the lawn to be mowed or how I expect that report to be written. If I haven't communicated that to you and sat with you or given you an example or drawn, like I love, I think it's actually in Brene Brown's dare to lead. She says, paint a picture of what done looks like. And I think a lot of the times we get pencil sketches on the back of a napkin instead of a painting right? And so as leaders, whenever, and and I try to do this with both my kids, my husband, my friends, like whatever, whenever I'm feeling like I have an outcome that they are helping me meet or responsible for, what does a good job look like? And, And I get detailed about it because now there's a chance you might actually be able to do it. Now there's a chance we're actually this close, you know, like we may be centimeters apart instead of feet. Yes. Well, I, I found too, and I think you can talk a little bit about this from your perspective, but I found on occasion, I need to get more disciplined and better with this up front, like painting that picture. Sometimes for me, even when I do that, and I'll say, as long as it ends up looking like this picture, I'm good. And then I see how it's being painted and I'm like, I'm, my skin is crawling and I'm like, that's not, no, I can I say something? I'd like to add something here. And I think I'm getting better at just shutting my mouth and saying, listen, if the result ends up like that, that's what I want. How we get there, why do I care, right? And I think especially with delegation and more growing, and I, I have to do less. I have to trust other people. That's people on our team. That's third-party consultants. Like, I need to let go. And sometimes I think the second stage is harder than the first. I, I clarified exactly the criteria I'm looking for. And yet I'm seeing updates and I'm less like, and my wife will, again, personal, professional, she'll look at me, she's just like, dude, just relax, ignore it or go in the other room. You'll see it when it's done, right? Because otherwise, you know, we're either, that's two big opportunities that we can screw this whole thing up. Yeah. And I think, I think there are times when the process doesn't matter. The how, you know, we get there as long as the end thing looks like we said it would. And there are times when the how actually does matter, you know, and I think to go back to our audience, which is construction, it matters, you know, what's behind this drywall wall. It doesn't just matter that it looks pretty on the outside, (laughs) but it actually matters what's behind there. Sure versus, you know, maybe a report in how you pulled together the data or surveyed the audience. I might do it in SurveyMonkey. You might use Google Forms. Somebody else might go do personal interviews. That doesn't matter. We got the same data. We're pulling it together. So I think this is also something as leaders we have to really think about is, does the process matter? And if it does, we better be clear about it. Otherwise, we're going to be irritated, probably pissed off, probably resentful that they didn't follow the right steps in getting there. And we're going to have to go back and it's going to be a whole lot of rework. And then we're going to be angry about that. And so that's that's really what this whole like expectations or resentments under construction to me really means is like, take the time to be clear about what and how you want. Does it matter? Does it not matter? And tell people, have the conversation up front. Aaron, if I can, I'm going to co-op some of your expertise here. Here, we're still in chapter six here. Well, let me paint the picture here and then I'll read it. I've got a client, and I think like a lot of folks who are listening, they can relate to this, is uh, they have they have equity ownership. Their name's on the proverbial building, multi-generational business. They are in this. And this idea of kind of expectations and where I'm leading into is uh, on page 111, you kind of talk about getting to know yourself. And I think you have some incredible questions here. Very simple, very powerful. And I think a lot of people struggle with these. I can tell you firsthand, men, dudes among us, more so, four questions. What are my dreams? How do I want to feel? What do I love to do? And what do I know I never want to do again? How might you help some audience members who are thinking, Aaron, yeah, no, I I get it. Those are really important. But here's the deal. Stuff that I love to do and stuff that I'd never want to do again. I got my grandfather here. I got my dad here. I got my brother in the business. My cousin works over there. My sister works over there. And sometimes in a family business, this is the way we were raised and you got to do stuff you don't love to do. So 
this all sounds great for people that are employees. How does it work when it is literally your name on that invoice that you got to stand behind? And sometimes you don't get to live your dreams. You got to live <laughs> the dreams. And, and meanwhile, you have multiple generations that are like, yeah, no, it sounds fun. You live in your dreams. Well, none of us have lived our dreams either. So buckle up. Yeah. And I think that's a tough one, right? Because it's going to require first, you got to know what the dream is. So that's going to be uncomfortable is to, to do the dig in to figure that out. And, and, and then you got to look at, it just takes us back to where we started in terms of, are we protecting and defending the current way or the dysfunction or the, you know, way it's always been done? Cause that's what's happening in this family business. Or are we moving towards what we want? And I think the scary part for us as human beings is our, our logic and our rational side of our brain can see point A to point B and all that needs to happen. When we start to live it, our nervous system can't regulate and it goes, this is too scary. It's too much change at once. Go back to the way that it always was. And so the work and, and you know, what teams and clients and families and, and leaders have to do is what are the like one to two degree changes we can take and steps over a period of time that get us closer to where we want to be without throwing everything into shock, right? Without disrupting, you know, the business, the clients, this feeling of safety. Because if you move one degree at a time, the body and the human part of us can acclimate as we move. If we go 10 to 15 degrees at a time, it's too much. And the brain goes, you're not safe. Scary as all hell, get out, get out, pull the chute, you know, and go back. Well, you've said this a couple of times and I, I keep on looking at it. I also think it's really important for everyone to realize is that two things can be true at the same time is number one, we've been really successful and, you know, we've been successful for 20 years. We've been successful for a hundred years, whatever it is. And there is some incredible dysfunction going on here that we can address if we want. These both can be true. And I think sometimes it's like, all right, Mr. Consultant, you're telling, or Miss Consultant, you're telling me to do this. Well, why would you explain this when you've seen that, you know, for the last three years, we've grown profits year over year over year. And every one of those years has been our most successful year ever. And we've been in business for six decades. So now what? And I'll say, hey, congrats. I think you've done that. You know, meanwhile, carrying like, 45 pound plates from the gym just around all week with you. Like, let it go. You guys can go further, faster together. It's so true. And I see it. I see it predominantly in family businesses where you've got that generational, right? Because families have its own operating system. And then that tends to come into the business. If, if the business has been around for a number of years or decades, you will definitely run into that. You know, this is the way we've always done it. It's worked so far. Why would we change something that we know? The problem is the economy is changing. The, the, the workforce is changing. Technology is changing. Like everything around us is changing except for the way we're running our businesses and leading our teams. And it's like, this is the invitation to, to drop the weight, you know, and to, to actually look at how could I, so instead of saying, how do I keep it the same, you know, and start and keep holding on and gripping tighter to what we know, it's like, let's release it. And how can I, how can I make it easier? You know, it's just a different question to reframe our focus. Well, you mentioned in the book and I, I, I thought it was really powerful, but I forgot this until you said it here. Is this, what you just said there is, this is the invitation. You know, and I can imagine just saying that out loud or people saying it to me like, hey, let's just be really clear here. This is the invitation. Now, you may refuse the invitation, but this isn't just something we're saying or this isn't just something that happened. This right here, we we are at a, you know, a, a fulcrum point. If you want to, this is the invitation. What do we want to do? Okay, we're going to choose to do nothing. Status quo bias. That's okay. But this is the invitation. I'm going to be really clear with you there. That You mentioned that a couple times in the book, and that really kind of hit me because it's really, I think it's just really visceral. It is. And you're going to get lots of those, right? Over the course of your lifetime, your career, you know, you'll get them on projects, you'll get them on teams, you'll get them in your career, you'll get them in your home life, you'll get them with your kids, your spouse, your partners, your business colleagues. You'll get all kinds of invitations to to turn around and kind of look at, is this working or not? Is this who I want to be or not? And it all comes down to what we practice daily. 
what we do daily is kind of practice for who we're becoming. There's a lot of things we tell ourselves, all of us, that may not necessarily be true, but we tell ourselves often enough that we start to believe it. And so it's just a matter of turning around and looking at that and going, you know, that's really what these questions that we started this segment was about is how do I want to feel? Who am I? What does light me up? And how can I move to be in alignment with that? Well, maybe this is a good transition to our part three here. And I'm going to lie down personally on the proverbial leather couch here for you because going to this first one, kind of that on like, who do I want to be? I think for a long time, we kind of, it was a kind of essentially a sole proprietorship. It was me. I was the work and it was like, I was only really responsible and accountable to our clients. And we took that with the up, utmost responsibility and bend over backwards, do whatever you have to do to deliver a great product. Well, now we're growing the team and this quote from Richard Branson hit me. He's like, I still feel we consistently deliver that to our customers. However, internally, I know we've taken a lot, a lot of projects. A lot of them have been new and if my teammates are being uh, uh, candid with me. They'll say, yeah, you'll often say you're going to do something and then you don't do that. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I want to be the guy that says, I want to do what I always say I'm going to do. So this quote was, um, again, Richard Branson, if someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not sure you can do it, say yes, then learn how to do it later. I feel like these two for me are living out right now. There's these new opportunities. They're tough, they're hard, but they're really valuable to clients. It's allowing us to grow. And meanwhile, I think I'm probably a pretty crappy teammate because everyone's like, well, <laughs> his name's on the place. He runs it. He pays us, but not really reliable. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. So how might you balance? What advice would you give me on how to balance those two when there are new opportunities that are really going to stress you? But also, you know, if you lose the, the trust and accountability with your teammates, everything else, it's only a matter of time before that goes to hell too. Yeah. I think the first thing is, is you can't, and you know, people are always surprised when I tell them like, I'm working with a coach. They're like, what you have a coach. And I'm like, well, yeah, because it's so important for us to do our own work, right? Because that's, we can only take other people as far as we have gone ourselves. And so if I'm saying yes to a new opportunity, I need to seek out that mentor or that coach or that person that has done what I want to do. Right. And and to then enroll them in helping me learn this new, this new skill, this next level, whatever it is, because there's <laughs> this whole conversation. What gets what got you here won't get me there, you know? And so I've gotten this far, you've gotten this far. This next leap you want to take in growing the business is going to require you to show up in a different way, right? It's going to require you to peel back a few layers probably put us some new skills and practice some new things that are going to be hard at first. There's definitely going to be emotionally uncomfortable conversations, situations, you know, circumstances that are going to pop up. And it's the only way to get to where you want to go. For this quote from, from Branson, are there other, are there other folks out there that we haven't mentioned that you would really kind of look to as like, and this has been a mentor for me, Aaron, personally, but it's someone like out there I've read their works. I've learned a lot from them, but maybe you know Richard Branson. Maybe you've partied on his island, whatever that's called. But if not, like, are there other mentors that you're like, that I'm learning from them, but just from a distance? Yeah, I would say my kind of two go-tos, I love the work of Simon Sinek. You know, I think his his work specifically around empathy and leadership and some of the stories that he's told and people that he's worked with um, are very powerful. And I think he's somebody that, that understands and just has a very eloquent way of, of articulating, you know, our organizations can only move at the speed of the depth of our relationships, right? And so if we have very shallow kind of transactional relationships, our business is probably not moving very quickly because ultimately for most people, you know, highly technical AI type businesses aside, but for those people that are in this audience around construction, it is people building the things. Like we can only move as fast as the people are willing to go. And, and so if you can invest in those relationships and really make sure they're strong, people feel heard, understood, belong, then, then you start to pick up momentum and you start to really 
play, you know, as he, his latest book is called the long game. And I think that's just it, right? We need, we're in this for the long game, right? It's not about the short wins for most of us in this industry. And the other one I think that has, has really been a mentor, you know, again, from a distance, but uh, does a lot of work in this space is Brene Brown. And just, you know, especially around vulnerability um, and its ability to unlock creativity, innovation. Yeah, I just heard somebody, I heard this, I read it, I don't know where, but they were talking about Brene Brown working with the U.S. military. And they said, uh, initially, we don't use the word vulnerable here. And she says, well, do you ever use the word courage? Oh, this you know where this was? This was uh, it's from our previous podcasts. I think Dr. Daryl Stickle said it. And uh, she had said, how could you ever do something courageous if there wasn't some level of vulnerability? And I, I'm like, that, obviously I'm saying it here, that just kind of punched me in the gut, right? And I think if if that's the way in the military, there's probably a lot of this same sort of kind of mindset uh, between the military and construction industry, but that kind of that same idea about, hey, th- those are those are two sides of the same coin. They really are, you know, and you know, even just trying something new, building a project we've never built or designing something and then having to execute it. You know, we do that all the time. We're pushing the envelopes of what we can design, build, construct all the time. All of that has an inherent level of risk, which is, and in order to do that, we have to be vulnerable, right? We have to be willing to try. We have to be willing to pour the concrete and rip it all out the next day because it didn't work right. Um, You know, whatever it is, it's just, you know, we think about those things, again, vulnerability through the technical lens of the situation or the the context of the problem, not vulnerability as a person. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful place to end here. Before we go, I want to make it super obvious. As you can tell by my notes, right? And having you on here, uh, this book here, Inside Out Empathy, Aaron, really helpful. And it, it's, it's easy to read. I, I have a little OCD with white space. And I was like, this, this is what white space looks like done well in a book. So that really resonated with me. Why don't you take it from here? Do not be bashful. Make it super obvious where people can reach out to you, learn about the work you do, how you help your clients. Why don't you lay all that out right now? Sure. Thank you. The best place is probably just to send me a quick email. It's Aaron at AaronThorpe.ca. Great to connect with you there. I am on social media, LinkedIn and Instagram are probably the two best places to connect with me in the work capacity. And as far as work goes, you know, it usually starts with some kind of speaking engagement, maybe a leadership conference or an internal training day that you're having uh, for your, your leadership team. I'd love to come in and just plant some seeds around how empathy and leadership may help unlock some creativity, innovation, and belonging in your organization. And then from there, we can look at you know bigger engagements around training, facilitation, and coaching, just depending on what the needs of the organization are. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I've learned a lot. And this is, uh, I just find books that are well-written like this, on uh, this sort of topic, there's always something we're dealing with. There's certain stuff that we're dealing with personally and professionally that this was helpful to address. So I want to thank you and thank you for making time. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great conversation. All right, friend, how did that go? Hopefully you enjoyed my conversation with Miss Erin Thorpe. She's the author of Inside Out Empathy, subtitle, Explore the Underestimated Superpower Essential for Building, Developing, and Inspiring a Rock Solid Team. If you're only listening to this as audio, which makes sense, it's a podcast. However, we are increasingly doing more and more video, including this conversation with Aaron Thorpe. And we are putting that on YouTube. We're splicing it into smaller chunks. Why? To make it easier for you to share these insights with other people. So if you have not seen or you have not subscribed, you can go to YouTube, look for Bradley Hartman and Co. And you will see the videos from my conversation with Aaron Thorpe, as well as all these other guests that we've done remotely like this. She's in Canada and the ones, of course, that we've done face-to-face. If you did get value from my conversation with Aaron Thorpe, do me and my team a small favor. Take a second, rate and review this podcast. That means more to us than you know as we strive to reach a larger audience to bring our construction community together to help each other lead better and build better and grow more profitably. All right, I'm done. That's all I've got. We're going to close out with our leadership mantra. You, my friend, are owed nothing. Deliver value first. Make it a great week.